Well, uh, Dr. Walker is the uh, newly elected president of Lee University, and uh, my wife and I are both alma maters to that great school uh, about 40 minutes south of us. And so Lee University is very dear to our heart. Uh, and when we were asked about hosting this weekend shadowing, I quickly replied uh, this fall to Dr. Walker and invited him to come and speak to us this morning. Uh, we're so honored to have him here and his wife, Udella, and uh, we're delighted. And uh, your son's in the back, who's a faculty member of Lee University. They have uh, two children and three grandkids, and I can see a couple of them back there right now. Dr. Walker was actually pastoring First Assembly of Orlando uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. So he does have some Assembly of God roots. Um, and then he went to Mount Perrin Church of God in Atlanta, where he served for uh, 25 years, 20 of those as the lead pastor. And uh, just a few years ago, 2017, uh, Dr. Khan invited him to a position of vice president at Lee University. And just three years later, it was announced that he would be the next president. So uh, today we have the honor to welcome the new president of Lee University, my friend, Dr. Mark Walker. Please welcome him with me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Everybody doing good? Look good. Enjoyed that beautiful worship. Thank you, worship team. That was uh, very, very well done and really felt the presence of the Lord here. Pastor, thank you for letting us intrude on you this weekend. We have close to about 30 of our ministerial students that were with us yesterday morning, uh, as your pastor said. And uh, then here this morning, and uh, as your pastor said, I was in pastoral ministry for over 33 years, and so I understand uh, being a pastor, weekends are very, very precious, and Sunday is such a big day in the life of a church, and to allow a group of people to come in and just kind of mess that whole schedule up is a big sacrifice. So to you, to all of your staff, thank you for sewing in to our students. I believe uh, they're going to take away from here this week and a lot of great stuff that's going to help them further in their studies and further in their ministries as God leads and directs them. It's a, it's a pleasure and privilege to be with you and have the opportunity uh, to minister. I've gotten to know uh, your pastor and, and his wife uh, over the past couple of years since being at Lee, and uh, I've just fallen in love with them in terms of just their, their sincere heart for God their sincere heart for you. They love you. They love this church. You are their flock. And boy, you can feel it every time you talk with them. But I think you know this. You are very, very blessed with your leadership. Would you agree with me on that? you got a tremendous, <laughs> tremendous leadership team. If you have a Bible, turn with me, please, to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 24, chapter 24. Um, and I just want to talk with you briefly this morning about conflict, dealing with conflict, people you're having a hard time with. When you just have people in your life that are tough to get along with. I know nobody in the room has that problem, right? Let's talk about that together. Father, we love you and thank you and praise you because you're a great God. You're a great God who has provided us everything we need for life, and for godliness through your Son, Jesus Christ, by your Spirit. And now we turn to your Word, Lord. I ask you to lead, guide, and direct us by your Spirit. Father, I'm not here to perform. I am simply here to be used as your instrument for these next few moments. May we leave this place knowing we have heard from you today. For your praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. His name is Daniel. He's from Brazil. He was an Olympic bodybuilder. His dream was to own his own fitness gym. And the gym where he worked, the owner came to him one day and said, Daniel, if you can get the money together, I'll sell you this gym. So excitedly, he goes down to the bank and starts talking with the banker. And for a couple of days, they're working through all the paperwork. And the, the banker says, okay, everything looks good. But to give you this loan, you got to have a cosigner. So Daniel went to his brother, and his brother agreed to co-sign it. So they co-signed on the loan, and the banker said, okay, this should be ready in a couple of days. A couple of days go by. The banker notifies Daniel and says, hey, the money's available. You can come down and pick it up whenever you, whenever you want to. So the very next day, first thing in the morning, Daniel heads down there, walks into the bank, and the banker looks at him and says, 
Daniel, what are you doing here? And Daniel says, well, I, I, came, I came to get the money. He said, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you knew. Your brother came in yesterday, took the money, and paid off his mortgage. Daniel was devastated. He was livid. His brother had stabbed him in the back. His brother had betrayed him. Daniel raced to his brother's home, enraged, literally going to kill him. Goes to the front door and pounds on the front door, but his brother was smart. His brother answered the door holding his little daughter in his arms because he knew Daniel wouldn't touch him, and Daniel didn't. But Daniel, through gritted, clenched teeth, looked at him and said, the next time I see you, I will break your neck and kill you. Daniel didn't see him for two years. For those two years, he had to work to start paying off that loan and struggle with his rage and his unforgiveness and his bitterness. And then one day after two years on the crowded streets of Brazil, he saw his brother. His brother didn't see him. Daniel came up to him and grabbed him by the shoulders and turned him around. And when his brother saw who it was, he tried to break away, but Daniel was too strong and his brother braced for his beating. Ever been there? Ever been betrayed? Ever been stabbed in the back, forsaken? Someone hurts you, let you down? All of us have to deal with conflict in relationships. All of us have to deal with the struggle of when people say one thing and do another. All of us are tempted sometimes with revenge and retaliation. And maybe some of us, and I would venture to say there are some of us that are struggling with that right now. We've all had to deal with difficult people. When you think about it, you can think of a person right now that's a difficult person in your life, especially in your family. Every family has that one family member that you dread coming to your family events. You just know when that person shows up, it's just going to be a mess. They get on your one last nerve. Every family member has that kind of a person in their family. Now, if you can't think of anybody in your family like that, I hate to tell you, you're that person. <laughs> I'm just telling it like it is, you know. Some people can't even get along with themselves. You know any people like that? Heard the story of a man who was on a desert island, stranded all by himself, been there for years. One day he's walking on the beach, he sees this ship way out in the ocean. And he builds this huge fire and the ship sees the fire, steers, uh, the captain steers the ship uh, to, the, to the island and comes ashore and there's the man and the, the captain is just amazed at how long this man's been there. And he says, well, 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 what did you do for food? What did you do for shelter? And he told him about food and then he said, well, for shelter, if you look up on that ridge, there's, there's that, you'll see that shack right there. That's my home. I built that. Well, this captain saw it, and then he saw one building, another building on his right, and another building on the left. He said, well, what about those other two buildings? He said, oh, that one over there on my right, that's my church. That's where I go to church. He said, well, what's that one on the left? He said, oh, that's the church I used to go to, but I got mad. They made me mad, so I left, and I go to that church now. <laughs> Difficult people. How do we deal when people have hurt us? How do we deal when people have let us down? When we find ourselves struggling with this sense of anger, maybe even a sense of hatred. Maybe with people that if we really got honest with ourselves, we might even say they're our enemy. Let's look at this a moment. And let's look at it from the standpoint of Saul and David out of 1 Samuel 24. Now let me give you a backdrop here as to what's going on. Saul is king of Israel. But David has been anointed king and chosen as the king to succeed him, but he's not king yet. And Saul has made David a high-ranking official in the military, and David, David has led many, many victorious battles. And he's becoming more popular in the eyes of the people than Saul is. And Saul is becoming very jealous. And Saul has put many plots together to try to kill David. But God has overthrown those plots. 
And we find David now on the run from Saul as Saul is chasing him. David has about 600 men that are following him and serving him. And these 600 men are outcasts. They're disenfranchised. They're outlaws. They're people on the run from Saul as well. And Saul finds out where David is in trying to track him down. And we're going to see an encounter here that helps us understand how do we handle conflict with others. Beginning in verse 1, this is what the story says. After Saul Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. The first thing I would say to you is this we see in David. David took responsibility for his own actions. David took responsibility for his own actions. You see, David and his men believe that God has turned Saul over to them. And David sneaks up on Saul, cuts off a corner of his robe, and we're really not sure why he does that. But when he does that, he's convicted by God. And he realizes that this is wrong, what he's about to do. And instead of executing wrath on Saul like he intended to do, by the conviction of God, he shows Saul mercy. And he actually goes back to his men who wanted him to kill Saul, and he rebukes them. Now think about this a moment. These guys have been following David. These guys are tired. These guys are probably ready to get home. These guys are tired of being on the run. They're living in this cave. They have the opportunity to cut the head off of the snake. There is Saul. They can do him in. And they have devoted their life and time to to David. And David refuses to do it. He doesn't give in to the peer pressure of those saying, this is what you need to do. Instead, he follows the way that God wants him to do. He took responsibility for his own actions. It's as though David seems to realize that even though Saul is the aggressor of the conflict, he has his own part to play in the relationship of conflict. He recognized And I think this is important for all of us to understand. He recognized that his actions aren't justified based on what Saul does or doesn't do, what Saul did or didn't do. It's based on what God wants him to do. See, we have a responsibility on how God wants us to deal with other people, even in conflict. And maybe that other person is really the source of the conflict. Maybe that other person is really the aggressor of the conflict But no matter how it started, every one of us must take responsibility on how we're going to deal with the conflict moving forward. How are we going to treat that person? Am I going to treat this person the way God wants me to treat this person? Or I'm going to treat this person the way I want to treat them or the way the others say for me to treat them? See, David got a hold of God's way. And I believe the only way David was able to do this was that he had an attitude change. He had an attitude adjustment. And that he recognized that he had to see Saul a different way. Now Jesus gives us an important attitude adjustment that we have to keep in mind when it comes to conflict. See, attitude is a huge thing when it comes to dealing with other people. Listen to what Jesus said about adjusting our attitude. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 44, here's what he says. Now you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Hmm. What if your candidate doesn't win in a couple of weeks?
What do these words might mean about that? It's interesting to me. When I hear these words, I always have to adjust my attitude. I don't want to pray for those that persecute me. I want to pound them. I don't want to love my enemy. I want to leave my enemy. Paul gives us some attitude adjusting in Romans 12, verses 17 through 19. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And that's what we see David doing here, really. David is honoring God on how he's going to handle this. He's taking responsibility for his own actions. A second part of dealing with conflict begins in verse 8. Saul has left the cave. Verse 8 tells us, Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My lord the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on my Lord because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. David took responsibility for his own actions, but secondly here, he spoke the truth with grace. He spoke the truth with grace. Look look what happens here. David tells Saul the issue. He doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't sweep anything under the rug. He doesn't act like no wrong occurred. What does he say? Why are you trying to harm me? You have wronged me. You're trying to track me down and kill me. He is telling the truth to Saul. He's confronting him about this issue, but he's doing it with grace. How did he do it? It says he bowed down on his face in honor of uh, Saul. It says he called him master. He called him father. See, David's not trying to get a pound of flesh out of Saul. He's not berating Saul. He's not calling Saul names. He is simply pointing out Saul's offense, but he does it with grace. Truth with grace. Can you think of anybody in the Scriptures that embodied truth and grace more than anybody else? Jesus Christ, right? John chapter 1, verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten, full of what? Grace and truth. What is so powerful about truth and grace? See, truth and grace together bring conviction, and they move people towards a Savior. Now listen to me closely here. Truth without grace breeds legalism. Grace without truth breeds license. Truth and grace breeds liberty. See, the ultimate end game of resolving a conflict is not proving who's right and wrong. The ultimate end game is to bring reconciliation. It's to bring together. Now that may take some time. And it's not acting like nothing happened. It's, it's, it's getting to the truth, but doing so. When David says this to Saul, verse 16, look what it says. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I, he said. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me about the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? 
May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. What is happening to Saul? It seems like Saul's being convicted. It seems like Saul is starting to repent. He even acknowledges David as being the next king, which I don't think prior to this time he had actually acknowledged that. And even says, your kingdom is going to be great. He even speaks of blessing that the Lord would reward him. You see, this truth and grace approach from David seems to be starting to change Saul's heart. Now, unfortunately, Saul did not follow through with his repentance. Because just two chapters later, we see Saul pursuing David again, trying to kill him. But David's behavior and his attitude, listen to this now, his behavior and attitude isn't based on the behavior and the attitude of Saul. What Saul is doing does not have to define and dictate what David does. David is going to speak the truth and grace. And I believe the way that David is able to do this is that he begins to see Saul through God's eyes and not just his own eyes. Because when David, when Saul came into the cave, David saw his enemy. But when the Lord gets a hold of David's heart, he shifts and sees Saul as God's anointed. See how I treat people and speak to people really depends on the lens by which I see them. Am I looking at them through my own hurt, my own pain, my own unforgiveness, my own dissatisfaction, my own betrayal? Those are very real and those are very painful. Or am I trying to look at them as God sees them? How do I see them? What is the lens? Am I seeing them as a person who deserves my wrath? Or am I seeing them as a person who needs God's love? How do I view the folks that I'm in contention with? I think David has a shift in the lens by which he sees Saul. Anne Lamont, she's a Christian author, a speaker, she's a blogger. I've read some of her stuff, but I came across this quote that kind of stopped me in my tracks. She said this, You can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. What's the lens? I got to see people as God sees them. David took responsibility for his own actions. He spoke with truth and grace. And here's the final thing I'll leave with you on this. Beginning in verse 12. This is David speaking to Saul. May the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds. So my hand will not touch you. David placed Saul in God's hands. He took responsibility for his own actions, spoke the truth with grace, but then put Saul in God's hands. David says, I'm taking my hands off you. I'm not going to try to control you anymore. I'm not going to try to convince you to see it my way. I'm, I'm not going to try to try to get you to, to be something. I can't make you be. I am putting you in the hands of God. I am letting go. Some of us right now are perhaps in some relationships where we've got to turn that person over to God. We got to let God be God in this situation. See, there's only one God. And it's not you and it's not me. It's interesting to me. Now, hear me close on this. It's interesting to me. If you read the rest of this story, after this whole confrontation between Saul and David, Saul goes back to Jerusalem. David goes back to the battlefield. They don't become best friends. They don't start hanging out together. 
They don't start texting one another. No. They create space between one another. What's my point? Sometimes we may have to create some distance between the people we're in conflict with. We may have to create some space between us and them, especially if abuse is involved. If they will not repent, they will not change their ways. If you're in a place of abuse or there are people you're in charge of that are in place of that abuse, I've got to turn that person over to God and I've got to create space. You see, David was not going to remain in a position where Saul could harm him. He kept the distance and turned him over to God. And as I mentioned, just two chapters later into chapter 26, we almost see an exact confrontation. Saul is pursuing David. David has an opportunity to take him out. David doesn't. David speaks truth with grace. And David turns him over to God. Sometimes I have to keep going through the process. Is this making any sense to anybody? Each day, I've got to take responsibility for my actions. Each day, I've got to speak truth with grace. Each day, I've got to turn that person or those people over to God. Let's go back to the story of Daniel that I opened up with. A bunch of you have been sitting there going, what happened to Daniel? I'm going to tell you right now. When we left Daniel, if you recall, he had his brother in his clutches, remember? His brother had betrayed him, taken the money for the gym and paid off his mortgage. Daniel threatened to kill him the next time he saw him. It had been two years since he had seen him, and there he had him in his clutches. But let me tell you, before how the story ends, what happened to Daniel in those two years, Jesus Christ became his Lord and Savior, transformed his life. But he kept struggling with his anger and his rage towards his brother. He kept dealing with that hurt. And he, he, he struggled with granting him the forgiveness that he knew the Lord wanted him to exercise. And there Daniel had his brother in his clutches. Now this story is told by Max Licato in a book entitled The Applause of Heaven. And Licato tells the story. Here's the words of Daniel when he's got his brother right in front of him. Daniel says, I saw him, but he didn't see me. I felt my fist clench and my face get hot. My initial impulse was to grab him around the throat and choke the life out of him. But as I looked into his face, my anger began to melt. For as I saw him, I saw the image of my father. I, I saw my father's eyes. I saw my father's looks. I saw my father's expression. And as I saw my father in his face, my enemy once again became my brother. Then Lakato adds his own thoughts to this story. And Lakato says this. The next time you see or think of the one who broke your heart, look twice. As you look at his or her face, look also for his face. The face of the one who forgave you. Look into the eyes of the king who wept when you pled for mercy. Look into the face of the father who gave you grace when no one else gave you a chance. Find the face of God who forgives you in the face of our enemy. And then, because God has forgiven you more than you'll ever be called on to forgive another, set your enemy and yourself free. And let the hole in your heart be healed. That person, those people you're in conflict with right now, 
Are you taking responsibility for your own actions? Are you speaking truth with grace? Are you seeing them as God sees them? Placing them in His hands. Because there's the place of healing. There's the place of reconciliation. There's the place of redemption. Father, I thank you for these wonderful people sitting in this room right now. I thank you for what I believe is your presence and spirit among us. And I believe you are speaking to many hearts, if not all of our hearts. Perhaps even taking us through an inventory right now of how we view certain people in our lives. Lord, I thank you that when we were your enemies, you came to find us. and You gave your life for us that we could be your child. Lord, help us by your spirit to find that, to give that same grace, that same mercy, that same attitude and spirit to those with whom we struggle. Father, I pray for the people in this room who are dealing with perhaps some pretty deep hurts because of what people did or didn't do. I pray your spirit is bringing healing. I pray your spirit is revealing things to them that they need to let go of or they need to pick up or whatever it may be. But God, I believe your spirit here is doing redemptive things in all of our lives. And God, I'm praying whatever relationships we have been represented in this room that are hurtful, that are at odds, I'm praying over the next course of weeks and months, maybe even years, there will be reconciliation and healing in these relationships, God. I thank you that you are a God that reconciles. I thank you for this wonderful church. I pray your blessings over this pastor, over the staff, over the leadership, every minute. I pray this church will be a beacon of light to this community of what it means to be reconciled to, your, to you by your son, Jesus Christ. I pray your redemptive Holy Spirit will pour out into this place. And I pray, Father God, that they're going to see more of you than they've ever seen before. And they're going to see great things happen because of your work in their midst. Make this body one together for your praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your time. To Dr. Mark. If you would stand with me, what a powerful message. What a powerful message. Thank you so much for sharing the Word of God. You know, to be able to do that, what he's talking about, you have to first get right with God. I think Dale started off the service even talking about that when he was opening up that first song. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here and maybe you heard these words and it spoke directly to your situation, maybe you're going through something relationally and you need the strength to be able to do that. You need the strength to be able to be reserved and to forgive. The only way we have that strength is through the grace of Jesus because we have to experience that. So if you're here or maybe you're watching online and maybe there's just not a close relationship with Christ, maybe you need to recognize the grace that he wants to give to you, and we have to be good receivers of that. And so if you're here and that's you and you just say, Pastor, I want to, first of all, make sure I'm right with Jesus so that I can have the strength to make my relationships right and so that I can receive that healing that Dr. Mark just mentioned. If that's you, would you just lift your hand up? Let me pray for you. Or if you're online, you can write right now that you just want to connect with somebody. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for grace. We thank you, Lord, that you came to, to give us life and to give it to the fullest. 
Father, right now we just confess that we are unable to make things right with you, but you made a way when there was no way. And so by faith we receive it and we walk in it. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of grace. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. And now, Lord, as we've learned this morning, as we've heard the voice of your Spirit speak, help us to give that grace to others. And, Lord, as your word says in Luke 4, that you came to heal the brokenhearted. Heal our broken hearts, God. Restore us and help us to walk in strength and confidence. Lord, this is indeed the day that you have made. We're going to rejoice and we're going to be glad in it. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these students. Bless them, Lord God. And Father, as we leave this place today, let us not leave your presence, but let us take your presence into our community. Lord, let us bring light. Let us bring hope. Let us bring healing. Let us bring grace. And yes, let us bring truth to each and every person we come into contact with so that we can be your witnesses all over Sweetwater, all over East Tennessee, and into the ends of the earth. We love you, Lord. We bless you and we praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen, amen. God bless you. I love you. Thank you for being here. If you need prayer, if you want to talk to somebody, I'll be here up front. I would love that opportunity. Otherwise, I pray you have a super great Sunday, and we'll look forward to seeing you live on Facebook this Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. God bless you. Have a great day.